So George, it's uh, wonderful to have you join us again. I know you were only up here March, maybe two years ago or so. So it's uh, it's wonderful to have you back in, on Penn State uh, well, grounds here. <laughs> Thank you. So um, as we do this, uh, the Center for Online Innovation and Learning has taken on a project called Coil Perspectives, right. where we invite people to come in and share their views on um, a, a limited number of questions. And this allows us actually to then queue up different thought leaders around specific questions. So I'm going to pose three to you today, uh, the ones we've been exploring. And, and the first has to do with, with your view and perspective of where you see education as a, a field of study and as a, as a phenomena in the, probably in the United States primarily, going in the next three to five years. Sure, well, you know, I, I think the hype of the, what's happening to universities has really been overplayed in media. And so there's an expectation, I think, in some, the part of some, at least the way the narrative sounds, that all of a sudden you're going to drive down the street and, you know, the university is going to be magically gone or it's yeah. going to be, I don't know, Disneyland or something. But I, I think physically and structurally, the university in the next three to five years is essentially going to remain what we see today. What we will see, probably most dramatically, is a trend that's already well underway, and that's just the digitization of the university. Even now, if you look at top tier systems, I know Penn State's been a lead in this in a long time, but other systems are starting up now, whether it's uh, your Harvards and your MITs and your, your Stanfords and others that are starting to pay attention to the digital space. Mm -hmm. It was something that initially online learning, the experience of going to a university was the physical campus. So online right. learning wasn't really a, huge, uh, a hugely important area of consideration. But now it seems that every major system that I've interacted with over the last few years at least has devoted significant resources to developing a digital or an online learning branch or department or something. And it's not just that these systems are being created as these systems develop online courses. It's very much a research orientation. What does digital learning mean to the future of our physical campus? What does digital learning mean to how we reach out to our, our alumni and a range of other questions? So I think probably the most dramatic trend is one that an average person driving by a campus won't see. And that's just going to be the, the continuing digitization of the teaching and learning process. I also think we're going to see early stages of uh, an enriched ecosystem of participants in higher education particularly. And uh, this is partly due to universities have at some points been a little bit reluctant to dive in with, uh, you know, very aggressively with mm -hmm. the future of these the range of trends, whether it's competency-based learning or learning analytics. They've sat a bit on the fence. And as a result, there's a range of providers and a range of vendors or corporate entity startups that now start to serve some of those specific roles. And so universities, rather than building that expertise in-house, are starting to partner with, with a range of startups. So I think you're going to continue to see that ecosystem of mm -hmm. education becoming, in the past it might have been, this is the main university. Mm -hmm. But in the future, it'll very much be, there's going to be a range of tools and a range of technologies where you're starting to see more in some ways, more of really what happened to businesses in the 80s as they started to experience this uh, hiring expertise that you need for your system. Another probably equally significant trend that universities have to adjust to is that the structure of our student population is, is changing mm. quickly. The, uh, for example, just in the U.S., uh, the white population, which has traditionally been the majority of higher education, is now, as of 2014, the first year going to become a minority. Uh, drop under 50%, whereas Hispanic population is probably the one with the most explosive growth. And some of those other uh, skills or need, needed attributes of learners are also changing, where individuals are aging. The average starter, f mm -hmm. starting age for university is, is increasing. The number of students that come back to university after having spent time in industry uh, because they're, the labor market's turning and, and new opportunities exist. So we're starting to see, I think, a complexification of a student profile so that vision of what is a Penn State student, I think in the future, uh, especially in the next five years, it'll certainly pick up. But in the long run, it'll be more dramatic, but that's going to change because it's no longer going to be that 17 to 25 year cycle of study. You'll see a lot of diversification of that population. Can I make an observation though? Because you just, you're just like stimulating this thought. So, so previously we would think of our college education as being this distinct experience from say 17 or 18 to 21, 22 ish. Right. What you're talking about is a, uh, is really a fundamental shift in how we think of education 
as a dis distinct experience to, to really becoming, I know the term is used often, lifelong learning, yeah. but that the learner will engage with their uh, educator of choice, may not always be Penn State or whomever, over, over, really over their career and yeah. perhaps over their lifetime in different kinds of ways. That's kind of cool. Yeah, well, there's some big opportunities for universities that are going to be a little more forward thinking. And, and if you look at it and say, all right, so in the past we had a four-year relationship, and then after that they were an alum, and, and we had a different kind of a relationship. Yeah, yeah. But I think very much it's going to be a, an ongoing learning knowledge relationship rather than learning yes. knowledge and then an alumni later. Yeah, yeah. The other aspect, though, that is uh, equally important to look at is that it's not just that that student is different. So it's not, not that you're, you know, that 18 to 21, 22 year old student now you have a different relationship with them, but you're going to find relationships with your students starting at a later age. And mm -hmm. this is OECD has published on just the changing demographics sure. of students. They're entering university at a later age. They're uh, maybe entering the workforce first and then they're coming back later. So all of a sudden, you know, in the future, a Penn State student may be somebody who comes in at 28, 29 or even 35 years of age and, and needs to reskill the employment mm. that they had suddenly robotics or AI mm. rendered that obsolete and now it's time for for, for them to reskill into a new field so it, it's an exciting opportunity for universities that play their cards well to be able to really broaden the offerings that they have for society so they've got to be positioned I mean to, to stay in the game you've got to be positioned there ready to accept and interact and have what that learner now wants yeah, because yeah. if I'm 18 years old and going to university, I'm going to have a different set of needs sure. than if I'm coming in when I perhaps already have a family and, right. yeah. and I've made, been able, you know, had a change in my work employment and now I've got a bit of a transition period. where mm -hmm. I, And it also means that we're going to have to start thinking more so about flexible degree options. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be a dedicated full-time student getting a bachelor's or master's. Right, right, right. It may be an increase in certificates. So people come in and get a baccalaureate or a certificate or they'll, uh, you know, some other model where, where they're sure. going to just come in to get the skills that they need to enter back into the workforce. Interesting. So I'm going to transition to the second question because that's a great setup. Um, I'm wondering what do you see will inhibit or I mean, higher ed is not necessarily known as the <laughs> swiftest boat in the canal. Yeah. I just made that one up, but yes, you know. With you. Um, so, so what, what will prevent institutions from realizing this kind of position placement in the future? That's such, such an important question because quite often we think of, oh, this is the change that needs to happen, but uh, understanding the inhibiting factors mm -hmm. of that change I think is quite critical. Probably the biggest thing that will inhibit is, is we have a heavy investment in our current way of thinking as a university. And that investment is evident in the physical buildings that we have. Mm -hmm. It's evident in the faculty-student relationship. It's evident in our administrative structures. It's, it's evident in really all aspects of the university. And I know some systems have started to, so one system I was working with in Australia in particular, what they've started to do is actually create a separate entity to begin addressing these, this array of changes mm -hmm. so that they have a little more agility and a bit more flexibility. Mm -hmm. They're concerned that they won't be able to innovate rapidly enough within the existing system. So mm -hmm. any of those factors, it's about economics it's, mm -hmm. uh, in, that inhibits innovation. It's about uh, faculty resistance. You can't overlook that either. It could be alumni as well that will say, you know what, I like my experience. I want yeah. my kids to have what I have. Right, right. And it may also be students as well because mm -hmm. we've conditioned our students from kindergarten on yes. to a certain kind of a learning and knowledge sure. model. And so all of a sudden they come to the university sector for us to then interact with them and say, oh, by the way, we have this entirely new teaching and learning model. We're right. going to there'll be resistance yeah, there. Yeah. So uh, those are probably a few of the, the more significant points of resistance, but if I can give an overarching umbrella, I would say probably most significant, it's that we're not creating a compelling vision. That's the biggest barrier, mm. is that we're not giving our faculty and our students and, and the Alumni uh, Association an opportunity to think of a compelling, provocative, inviting vision of what the future university could be. Instead, we're trying to push them in a direction rather than give them something that's, that they can look at and say, yeah. Yeah, I see that in my daily life. I see the technology. I see that I work yeah. differently. I see this going on. I realize universities need to change. And right now, I have a hard time finding university leaders that I would say that is. Yeah. A, they've managed to articulate the vision. But, but what I liked about what you just said was including all of those voices in the definition and the 
brainstorming of what that vision might look yeah. like. So instead of it being sort of a top down, this is how this is what we do as an institution, and, yeah. and you will behave this way. You're suggesting we, we need to get the the input from all of these various groups, and then create maybe a new shared vision. And we're not quite there yet. From what I'm exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. So. The institute that we're working in right now is dealing with um, leadership in the online learning domain. Okay. And one of the things we're trying to do is to help prepare the next cadre of leaders for this. Uh, any thoughts about the skill sets or competencies that they might need as they're moving into <laughs> a rapidly changing yeah. stream, so to speak? Well, definitely. I, I think the, the probably the biggest thing, and this isn't just leaders, but it's particularly pronounced for leaders, but it's to recognize that we've structurally shifted our relationships in society, where in the past a lot of relationships were mediated by institutions and by positions within an institution. And what I mean by that is that uh, we would rely on a, a person who has a certain position in an organization to give us the direction and the guidance. But we've moved to a networked world. Mm -hmm. And it's really tough to be a control freak in a network mm -hmm. structure. You need a different set of skills, a different set of attitudes, a different set of attributes. So everything changes when you begin engaging in networks. And that provides for a, a collaborative leader, a leader who is willing to listen and to network and partner with others, and not just within an institution, but across departments in, within that institution, but across uh, industries, across universities, across countries. There's, it's a global game now. And for leaders to be connected globally, to have colleagues from around the world that they can brainstorm with and draw the best insights from what's happening uh, in Australia or in New Zealand or in Scotland. Sure. Right? I mean, that, that's a huge opportunity for leaders to begin thinking that way. Uh, additionally, for leaders to begin thinking in terms of the collaborative potential. Mm -hmm. a, a leader, when you're in a in universities, we have a unique opportunity is we, we deal with, with some of the best and the brightest uh, members of society. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, our institutional structures don't allow that latent knowledge to be brought forward and to be used to solve some of these problems. So very much a consultative leader, a leader that thinks and functions in networks, and a leader that's willing to take advantage of knowledge that exists outside of the institution and really st stop thinking about physical space and start thinking about knowledge space. Yeah. I, I love those ideas. Uh, it's, it's some of what we talk about, and probably we need to, to reinforce this more. Uh, what you're also describing is that leadership may be more shared, and it may be uh, more fleeting at times. I'm going to hand over a responsibility. I'm no longer the, the decision maker or e even the person who creates the vision that it is more of a, of a group uh, ideas in, in getting input uh, from various organizations to move forward. And when you think of it, in most, most faculty, that's the nature of what they do with their research. It's not like you can mm. say, you are the leader of physics. It's, you know, we've managed to advance these knowledge domains very well through collaborative approaches, through sharing our ideas, uh, engaging with others around their ideas, and to advance those domains. So I think from a leadership end, that kind of a network structure, mm. that shared responsibility, different times, different leaders under different tasks, different opportunities, that seems to be a model to me that's more desirable in a networked age sure. than the more traditional hierarchical structure. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking your time to be here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> nice to see you again. Great, great to see you. And the best wishes to you. Thank, thank you. you.